Hello, folks. My name is DC Rockwell, and this is your co-host, Elio Grieco. Welcome to Code and Chaos, a pseudo-random conversation that starts with tech and ends where it ends an hour or two later. Tonight's conversation is brought to you by our subscribers and by EGX.org. Elio, I want to talk about Bitcoin, and specifically around mining and its effect on the planet. It's going to be a big bummer since this is a big week for Bitcoin, because uh, Tesla just invested 1.5 billion dollars into into bitcoin uh, i think that dwarfs the winklevoss's the winklevi the winklevi's uh <laughs> <laughs> the winklevi sounds like a uh, lewis carroll monster um it, it probably is <laughs> it just exists in real life <laughs> but um yeah i, I want to revisit uh bitcoin mining because a lot of folks are very excited about Bitcoin after this development and after the price shot up so high. And um, what can I say? I'm 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 here to harsh their mallow, um, marsh their mallow. Um, the reason why, though, is because I think a lot of folks don't really understand what Bitcoin mining is, and they might not understand why it might not be such a great thing for them themselves and for their future, you know, grandchildren, their grandchildren. And so anyway, let's start off with uh, Bitcoin mining and what it is, you know, because okay. I think that that's a, uh, a very nebulous thing. You know, it's um, it is a computer doing something. And I think a lot of people understand that, but they don't really understand what exactly it is doing. So the name mining is actually, I think, very appropriate for this because mining, real mining, like mining for gold, um, there's relatively not terrible ways to do that. And then there's industrial scale where you spray cyanide everywhere and you dissolve out the gold and it does all kinds of awful stuff to the water table and has a huge environmental impact. Um, so mining is generally thought of, even if you're just digging little holes, um, once you start doing it at scale, then it becomes really damaging and it does, it changes the environment in dramatic ways permanently. So, um, I think Bitcoin mining is properly named because it's insanely resource intensive. It was actually invented to intentionally be very, very resource intensive and so you might ask, well, that seems really stupid. Normally, we try to make things that are energy efficient. Why would we intentionally try to make something that's really, really horrifically inefficient? Like not like 10 times worse, but like thousands of times, millions of times worse. And the original idea, which was not a terrible idea, but it has some terrible consequences, was that if you have money and anyone can just make their own money, which is kind of what we're allowing people to do, well... That doesn't really work, right? Like if we just say money is just a piece of paper of a specific dimension, like the size of an index card, and you can just write whatever denomination on there, and then that's legal tender, the whole system would fall apart, right? You're like, oh man, I'm really hungry. I need to buy that sandwich. Oh, I'll just write a 20 on here. Here you go, right? And once anyone can print any amount of money, it doesn't work anymore. Like just the value is just nothing. You just, you just make money whenever you feel like it. And so the U.S. government in fiat currencies, like we use really, really high quality paper. We use like three di like distinct printing processes. Um, there's this really cool presentation a few years ago in Arizona that was a Secret Service agent. And she was talking about catching this counterfeiter that was so good. He got caught and they walked him into a bank and he exchanged like $10,000 of his counterfeit bills at a bank and they accepted all of them. <laughs> And they gave him clean bills to leave with. And again, banks have all kinds of stuff to check to make sure it's legit. And his stuff was so good that they couldn't tell. But he was extremely talented. It took him a long time to like collect all of the equipment. Because if you really know what you're looking for, the US dollar has all of these little things in there. I think there's some stuff from the treasury. They tell you some of the secrets, not all, but some of the secrets. And so they intentionally make the money, even though it's just paper money, they make it very, 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 very hard to make your own money. If you tried to print your own money, even buying the paper, that that really high-end money-grade paper, like you have to 
run through a, you know, jump through a million hoops. There's like one, one or two suppliers. I don't remember, but you have to know the right people. You have to have a ton of authorizations. You can't even buy the blank paper money's printed on without having special connections. Um, so anyway, mining is apt and Bitcoin, if anyone could just go ahead and make up whatever they wanted, the whole thing would fall apart. So we need a way to stop that. And so the original idea was we do something called proof of work and you have to like put in a certain amount of effort, in this case, computation and computation takes electricity and computers. So you have to have the money to buy a computer and then you have to have the money to you know get the electricity or have some source of electricity to run the computer. And you're basically turning electricity, using a computer to turn electricity into a virtual currency. Okay, that's a pretty good explanation. So mining is a way for us to make it difficult to create more of the currency. Uh, you have to, um, you know, you have to do something inside of this miner uh, in order to produce an actual Bitcoin. And then supposedly there's also uh, processes for validating that and making sure that it actually works. Yeah, you're looking for specific numerical patterns when you're mining. And so you just you do a ton of math. You you run a hashing algorithm, which is a way of kind of taking a digital fingerprint is the short version. And you run that lots and lots and lots and lots of times. And if you get lucky, you get, you know, you find one that has this certain pattern and you get a little bit of payment. You get, oh hey, you know, you get some transaction fees, or hey, you mine a Bitcoin, you get a brand new coin. Um, and I forget what the upper limit is. It's like 26 million. I have to look that up. Um, but the Bitcoin is a deflationary currency, which means there's an upper limit. The system is designed to only ever have a certain number of Bitcoin, and then you can't make any more. You're just you're not allowed to. The, the protocol itself says, nope, that's it. That's all of them. Right. And the, and the original idea was that anybody could mine Bitcoin. Uh, just anybody with an off the shelf, yeah. off the shelf you know, CPU could start running this algorithm and they were going to be able to start mining Bitcoin. But at some point, um, specialty sh chips started being made that can greatly outpace oh. our, our off the shelf, you know, chips. Yeah. And so it's not everybody anymore. It's that people who have access yeah. to specialty hardware, just like with the actual printed dollars. Yeah. L let's, before we get into that, I want to touch one on one thing, one difference, because there have been some interesting articles, um, a whole slew of them in the last week or two since Elon Musk has been doing his thing and manipulating markets, which, you know, SEC's already gotten on him for Tesla stock a few times. And he's learned his lesson, not that he's stopped manipulating markets, but he's very careful to stay within, like to color within the lines. And technically what he's doing is not technically to the letter of the law. It's just barely not market manipulation. Um, it's still having the exact same effect, um, but it's not technically. The SEC can't go after him and say, stop manipulating the markets because he's just like, hey, I like Dogecoin. I like Bitcoin. He just throws technologies out there and everyone's like, oh, Elon said to go throw money at this thing. And just Everyone just dumbly goes and throws money at whatever as fast as they can. There's literally an article or video and they're like, you know, if you can do this in five minutes, you can make some money. So if you're doing that, if the gap between him saying a thing and then you investing a whole bunch of money is five minutes, it's not a lot of thinking going on. It's not a lot of time to really, if you're not already familiar with what he's mentioning, you're just throwing money dumbly at stuff. You're not actually thinking through what you're doing. But one important thing that I definitely want to get in here is the difference between mining, because there's all these articles comparing gold to Bitcoin and all these people saying Bitcoin is the new gold. Well, yeah, mining gold is really environmentally hazardous when you do it at scale. It does a lot of damage. Um, and the thing with gold, though, even though most of it is just held as kind of reserves, gold is actually useful. And I've had a ton of people try to convince me that Bitcoin has intrinsic value. And I wonder how much lead is in their drinking water, because intrinsic value means a thing is just valuable for what it is. And Bitcoin is basically imaginary. It, it's a system for tracking who owns a uselessly large number and being able to transfer ownership, so to speak, of like, hey, I found this insanely huge number that I can't even pronounce. It doesn't have a name yet. Um, I'd like to trade you this huge number, DC, and you can give me some real stuff for the owning this huge, this huge number. 
Um, that's what Bitcoin is. So having a number, like owning a number is kind of a nonsensical thing. Within the system, we can agree that we only trade numbers based on who the system says owns the big number. But the problem is the number itself is not a physical thing. It doesn't really have intrinsic value. And the numbers are so big. We're talking way beyond like Undecillion. Like these are numbers may or may not even have names. Uh, so you're not going to count. Like if you're going to count all the atoms in the universe, maybe you'd use a number this big. Maybe not. Um, but it's really, you're not going to run into these numbers. So even if, it's not like if you had a patent on the number five, where every time someone used the number five, you got, you know, you know, you got a dollar. That'd be super valuable, right? People use the number five all the time. Every kid who's counting, learning to count, it says five a ton of times. You'd be filthy rich. But these numbers are so big that that's not a thing. So anyway, gold has intrinsic value. Gold is non-corrosive. It's beautiful. It's extremely ductile. You can pound it into almost atomically thin sheets. You can put it in glass to color the glass, to make the glass you know, reflect or absorb certain wavelengths of light. Like just on and on and on. Gold is incredibly useful for, because it's gold. And if gold was super plentiful, if, if instead of silicon, gold was one of the most plentiful elements in our, you know, our Earth's crust, um, we would still use gold. We'd probably use gold for all kinds of stuff because it is so useful. Like a whole bunch of stuff. Like you, you see very thin coatings of gold on like USB cables and various computer and audio cables because again, it's non-corrosive. A lot of other metals react with water or with oxygen and then they corrode and they either rust or like copper goes green, it oxidizes, gold doesn't. So yeah, we would be using gold for cables. We'd be using it for bullets because it's super heavy. It carries a lot of kinetic energy. Um, there's all kinds of, we would, if there was enough gold, we'd probably be using it for counterweights on cranes and things, right? There's a ton of different things you can do with gold that are not related at all to the fact that it's scarce. They're related to gold is just really, really useful. It's a really interesting element that conducts electricity well, it conducts heat really well, that just all kinds of like dozens and dozens and dozens of things. Oh, and by the way, in small quantities, it's good for you. Um, I don't remember the other diseases, but arthritis, that like small amounts of gold are actually good to cure, not cure arthritis, but to help manage symptoms a little bit. Um, it's too expensive for most people to be taking, you know, gold every day. But yeah, if you buy gold schlager or something like that, has little flakes floating in there. Um, you could totally drink gold. It's, it's going to actually be good for your body, like trace elements. Um, so it's obviously intrinsically valuable. And again, the value of gold, the current exchange rate of it's super expensive is based on the fact that it's scarce, but the intrinsic value of gold, like the things it can do that no other thing can do, there's a ton of those because gold is just where it is on the periodic table. Okay. So Bitcoin doesn't have any real uses other than to be a representation of a unit of, you know, basically uh, agreed in, upon value. In theory of exchange, <clears throat> in theory, yeah. And so uh, there's not really a lot that's different there from, say, a bill, right? Uh, so if I have a $10 bill, it's really yeah. that I'm, I'm owning uh, the serial number on this particular bill. And when I pass it off to somebody else, um, then they're accepting that there's some sort of value that they agree for that. Yeah. And so Bitcoin's sort of like, um, you know, non-fiat currency uh, in, in a way. Kind of sort of, yeah. Yeah, it, like currency is just a way of, instead of trading and trading and trading, like you're accepting basically an IOU. And as long as we all agree to accept these IOUs, then you can trade it for something you actually need or want later. And, um, you know, that... There's a joke that what... What backs the U.S. dollar? And it's kind of a joke, but I think it, it makes a lot of sense when you really think about it. The U.S. dollar is backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. nuclear arsenal, right? So the U.S. is a huge country with a very large economy and a massive military. And so for the dollar to go completely to zero, it's not impossible. A lot of big civilizations have come and gone. And who knows? We could collapse the way things are going some days. Um, but it's pretty unlikely. Um, so that's why the dollar has become the world's kind of global currency. And who knows, maybe with China and the stuff they're doing, they have a hell of an economy. They're, they're definitely trying to shift the, it was the yuan? What's the, the Chinese currency? Um, they're trying to make that the global currency. Uh, they would love it because anyone who controls, you know, the global currency has some options that other smaller countries don't. 
Um, but the one thing, this is taking longer than I wanted to to get to it. The one thing about mining, so we covered gold and even though it's terrible in some ways environmentally to mine gold, we could probably back off on how much gold we're mining. Cause like I said, most of it's just sitting in like Fort Knox and other depositories, just like sitting with a whole bunch of guards around it, not actually doing anything. Um, so we don't really need the amount of gold that we mine, but it is useful. Gold is intrinsically useful. And the big difference between mining gold or anything, gold, sapphire, emerald, like whatever stuff you mine, actual stuff you pull out of the dirt with literal mining versus cryptocurrency mining. The difference is once you're done pulling the gold out of the earth, you can trade it around and you can hand it off. And because it's non-corrosive, it's just forever until someone loses it or you know, a ship sinks and it goes to the bottom of the ocean, whatever, you can trade it around forever, basically. Whereas with Bitcoin, as soon as you stop mining, it just it's all gone. Mining is what actually keeps it not just finds Bitcoin for people, but it actually is the process by which the entire system operates. And that's why they try to give you a little reward. Like, well, why am I going to set up all these computers and burn all this electricity? Oh, well, we'll, we'll pay you a little bit for that. So that reward has to stay favorable because as soon as people stop mining Bitcoin, it's all gone. 100% of Bitcoin disappears if everyone stops mining. So unlike gold, like if they, if we stop mining gold tomorrow, everyone still has all their jewelry, all their coins. It doesn't just disappear. Like we, we took the hit and we, we destroyed some resources to get some other resources, but we still permanently have the benefit of those resources we acquired. Whereas Bitcoin requires continual destruction of resources to continue to exist. You never get to stop burning more resources. Okay, so one thing I want to just touch on, which uh, we said fiat currency twice, and for those who might not be as familiar with that term, uh, prior to 1971, all of the U.S. dollars were actually uh, backed by gold, and so when it said ten dollars on your on your bill, there was ten dollars worth of gold stored somewhere in the United States that. Um, it represented. Then in 1971, uh, President Richard Nixon unilaterally canceled this. And he said uh, it was part of a series of other economic changes that he was making. And uh, he and his party just said, no, we're not doing that anymore. And since then, they were allowed to print out more money than is being represented directly by gold. And so today, um, the dollar is, in fact, just uh, a piece of paper. You know, it's something that we agree upon its uh, in its value, uh, but it doesn't actually tie to gold the way it used to. If, if we were having this conversation in 1970, we could actually say that this bill actually has intrinsic value. This bill. Rep is this, or maybe not intrinsic mm. value, but uh, it represents intrinsic value. And yeah. I can go and I can, I can actually uh, exchange this bill for the actual gold, which is uh, something I learned on Pawn Stars <laughs> the other day, which is interesting. Which is that I think um, FDR actually was, or maybe it wasn't FDR. Uh, I can't remember, but one of the presidents made it illegal to own gold uh and this was prior to nixon and so there was a period where there was a fear that people were going to go down with their bills and exchange it out for its equivalency in gold from the reserve and uh, that we were going to lose all of our gold and we were going to lose the treasure the uh, the treasury of our of mm -hmm. our country and so he made it uh illegal he first off he canceled all of those bills that were direct representations of the uh so he canceled our currents all of the bills out there that were that said right on them that you can come down and you can exchange this out for the actual gold canceled all of those bills and then he put in a uh, a law that said that if you were caught with gold in your pocket, that you, this was a federal crime. So I thought that was an interesting bit of history. Thank you, Pawn Stars. Uh, there is a lot of extra value to that besides just watching a bunch of people getting rich off of 
other folks bringing in their stuff, but, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, anyway, so let's, uh, let's move on from this, the, the gold thing, because I think, I think it's pretty well understood now that Bitcoin isn't representing any particular, uh, anything that is useful. And when you say it's a useless number, what you're, what you're saying is that we can't do anything with this number. You know, we yeah. can't, this number is not going to be useful for doing literally anything. Uh, yeah. That's it. Numbers that big are only good for cryptographic keys. They're, right. they're just too big for any, anything else. Okay. So now we have to talk about how are these act, how are these numbers generated? Um, which is with a computer, but then we go one step deeper and say computers that are being run by electricity. And so we are pumping electricity into these chips. These chips are doing the computation and they're coming up with these numbers. And this is the start of where we start seeing a problem with what's going on with the Bitcoin mining, because that electricity had to come from somewhere. And we have a lot of different kinds of, a, of a power generation in, uh, in the world. But um, as I was looking up, I was trying to see, you know, are, are there, is there any kind of a, a power generation that doesn't actually have a, uh, you know, a, a bad side to it? And it turns out there's not. Not even solar, <laughs> not even wind power, not hydroelectric. They all have an ecological impact on the planet. If we use too much solar, then uh, we actually impact the planet. If we use too much wind power, we impact the planet. Too much tidal power, impact the planet. Too much geothermal, same thing. It's uh, There's a balance, and it turns out that none of these things are, in fact, infinitely exploitable. There's, there's only two that are close ish to that um there's of course nuclear mm -hmm. which you're taking a small amount of usually uranium or plutonium and you're actually converting it you know einstein's famous e equals mc squared which for anyone who doesn't know e is the energy matter so when you do this if, when you break apart of atoms you get the matter the mass times the speed of light squared and the speed of light c is a huge like what 186 uh mile 186 thousand miles a second or something it's some huge value squared so times itself so when you turn matter into energy which is what you're doing with fusion or fission it releases insane amounts of energy so you're actually destroying matter and turning it into energy but you get so much energy out of it that it takes very very little matter to turn into huge, huge amounts of energy. energy. Now, the, the problem, problem obviously with nuclear is you end up with some byproducts that are pretty dangerous and radiation is, it's kind of, unless <laughs> radiation is hard to detect without specialized gear. Now, it turns out if there's too much of it, you can feel it. If you can feel it, you're going to die within like a week. <laughs> That's really bad. Um, and it's not pleasant when you feel it. Um, so there's problems, um, but those, there's newer nuclear technologies that have let us deal, like we can deal with some of those problems better. So that's, if we manage it properly and are very careful, nuclear prevent, presents a opportunity. And then the other one is fusion. And fusion, um, instead of splitting atoms apart, it's slamming them together. That's how the sun works. So we basically, there are experiments right now to build tiny little stars on earth. And there's, you know, they've been working on Takamak style reactors where the problem is it creates so much energy that it melts the reactor. So they have to like do insane things to cool the reactor and then use really powerful magnetic fields to, you know, confine this super high energy plasma to stay away from the walls and then super cool them. And like, it's, it's, we're working on it decades getting there. I think they're finally starting to get more energy out because you have to put in a huge amount of energy to start the reaction. And then once you get it self-sustaining, you're supposed to get more out than you're putting in. We're getting there, but it's probably still at least another 10, 20, 30 years away, at least until we have working fusion reactors that are actually providing power to the grid. In theory, those should be a lot less nasty. They should provide a lot less, um, you know, when you start with fusion, or excuse me, fission, you're breaking really heavy elements down into smaller radioactive ones. When you do fusion, you're going, you're building up from like hydrogen. And so you don't get the byproducts that are nearly as radioactive. I think you still do get some, but it's not nearly as bad. Anyway, so that's about it, though. Everything else, like you said, there's some drawback. 
Yeah, and I also, um, you know, I'm not a expert on nuclear energy, but I do. I did hear that there are some reactor designs which use the spent fuel yeah, from other reactors. Yeah, and so there might be a good solution for that fuel being stored because if we can get those efficient and working well then we can actually start pulling the used fuel out of those stores that are apparently they're stored you know deep underground in places like kansas and and places like that and uh or maybe not kansas actually i think i just mi mix that up with the film vault Sorry, gotcha. there is some nuclear. <laughs> there are some nuclear films down there, but uh, probably not what I was thinking. But anyway, uh, we do have uh, places where we store these barrels of nu yeah. spent nuclear fuel. They sort of like um, cement them in, yeah. and then and keep on like creating different layers of them. Yeah, you, we could go back in, want... break those open, and uh, we could take the, the fuel back out with robots and use it as fuel in these other ones. Yeah, so, you do not want that stuff to leak. And there's a, an interesting unintended consequence of story where um, they use kitty litter too. So they have these little bitty containers that have this high-level nuclear waste that's super dangerous, and it will be for like hundreds if not thousands of years. And they put them inside a big 55-gallon drum, and they pack them with you know kitty litter so that which if i'm remembering right i think it's bauxite it's this absorbent uh, mineral you know traditionally so if it does leak hopefully it'll leak but then get absorbed and stay in the container and then inside this layers of concrete like you're talking about and not actually get into like water supplies so they switch to organic kitty litter and um the problem was that the organic kitty litter when it contacted the nuclear waste when there was a leak would actually expand and it caused the drums to rupture and actually made them more prone to leaking. <laughs> so uh, that was not cool. They found that out and they're like, oh, you, yeah, no, organic is not always better. Like stick to the, you know, the inorganic kitty litter with nuclear waste storage. You know, anyway. that, that makes a lot of sense considering that a lot of nuclear byproducts that come out of my cat are taken care of by the litter as well. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway. Um, Got a catastrophe going on over there, huh? So the point here is that all all power sources have some sort of downside to them. Nuclear is, in fact, one of the cleanest ways for our environment for us to be able to uh, to generate power, which is incredible. You know, there, my my parents were part of the ant the, the no nukes rally and and the anti nuclear energy. Uh, you know, which is funny because to the today. They both agree. Oh, well, actually, you know, we just we were against nuclear weapons. That's what we were against. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, before we kind of put a nail in that, I think the the big deal, the big difference is perception wise, um, like pollution from coal and oil. I just, I just saw, saw some studies that like the amount of people that die from it a year. The problem is it's a slow death. And it's very hard to trace that back. There's like several steps of like this crap going in the air, you getting asthma or COPD or cancer or all this, and then dying like five to like 50 years later. Um, so it's not flashy, right? And you're like, oh, I, I smoked. I probably died from the, you know, the smoking, not from the, the crap that's just in the air we're all breathing. Whereas nuclear, if you read a, about super criticality accidents, it's a really bad way to go. So it captures, people get terrified because it's a terrible way to go. It's very quick and it's very awful. Um, so I, I got to just stop us real quick. Oh, this is going to be fun. Uh, so sorry, folks, but um, it sounds like Alio, we had double input on you for oh. this whole time. So I'm going to do something real quick and we're going to see whether or not this fixes it. All right. Talk real quick. Yep. Still, uh, still double up, double the fun. We're going to find out. Um, but I think, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's about it. Ugh. All, All right. right. <laughs> Do we want to redo it or, oh. well, um, <laughs> Yay, technology. <laughs> Let's move all the money to Bitcoin. It'll work well. It'll work just as well as this does. Yeah, you know, technology is going to save us all. Um, <laughs> your first test was still doubled. Talk real quick. All right. Any better? Let's see. Double, single. <laughs> do it. Do technology, it. our friend or our enemy. 
Do a clap. It's Any looking delay? like one for me. Uh, I don't okay. know if it's doubled up. Let's. Oh, we're, we're still, still seeing. seeing. Hmm. Still. Oh, great. Well, this is fun. Um, let's see here. You're on three. And this is supposed to be on two, I think. Um, let's see. Let's try that one out. All right. Okay. I'm fine. Any, any progress? Do clap, Still so doubled? Do a tap. Do a clap. Looked like one on the on the. See, this whole time I would have seen something on the VU <laughs> meter. I thought. <laughs> Gotta love it. The um, yeah, a micro release update from Wirestream. Yeah, yeah. It? We it went from fourteen dot one to fourteen dot one dot one and uh, introduced some problems for us already. So fantastic. Yay, software. <laughs> well, I don't know. You want to turn this into a trashing wirecast <laughs> <laughs> i was kind of looking forward to some of the other stuff uh, the trash bit going on still, oh still huh oh, outstanding crap. so yeah i don't it just don't doesn't make a lot of sense all right so i'm gonna let's stop real quick i'm gonna stop the recording uh we're still streaming and i'm okay. gonna play back what it, we were recording since it's not gonna okay. be usable anyway and we're going to see what happened now. All right. Uh, fun stuff. Man. And it was going so well. All right. Here we go. Electricity and computers. So you have to. Oh, you got like, yeah, it's like flange or. Um, have the money uh, to buy a computer. And then you have to have the money to, you know, get the electricity or have some source. It, it is useful. Gold oh, is intrinsically weird. It's getting worse as the episode goes on. Hard to detect without special, and it costs the. Well, oh. um, <laughs> it's a cool little effect, you know. Um, neat. <laughs> 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 President uh, Obama says it's not a big deal, but he's a laid back guy. You he know? is a laid back guy. That would drive me nuts. I can see him being like, "Keep going." <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, I, I still want to figure out why is this happening to us? Technology, man, I swear. Um, let's see here. I've got. I wonder if it's actually coming through on the. I don't think it's coming through on the mix down here. So we have a. Um, we have a. Uh, mixer down here. Yeah, no, thanks for pointing it out, it. Nerf. Like, <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll I'm, just I'm glad go we ahead didn't and... do the whole hour with this, uh, the audio we can't use. That's, uh, that yeah, th that would have been a, <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. And at least now we can, uh, let's just turn this into a little bit of a, let, let's talk a little bit about, um, some of the redirection stuff we were talking about. I I almost wish we were talking about AI being overhyped because like, this is a better, it's, it's a better, better uh, illustration because the problems with Bitcoin are intentional. They're like design things like choices that were made. It's not doing it wrong. It's doing what it was designed to do. It was just a bad design. So we can't use this as an illustration of that quite as well. Yeah. It's amazing. It is 2021. I've never been to a conference of any size, tiny, huge, whatever their budget was, that the tech worked. There's always a glitch every freaking time. Whether they have a professional sound team and a sound booth with a whole like slate of mixers and like five people behind it, or it's like a little kind of tiny little 20 person thing. Every time the tech fails, you would think, you would hope, that we could actually get this stuff to behave in 2021. Oh, wait. Now I think I got it. Well, let's find out. Okay. I think I know what happened now. There we go. Sounded normal okay. for a second, he said. Okay. Let's it's see. Good oh, it's good. It's good. Oh, man, uh, I swear. Like, Is this the third or the fourth time you've had to redo everything because of a software update? Well, it just messed up all the audio settings uh, on this minor update. 
apparently they don't persist right. And I got to create a checklist um, or, you know, I, the part of what we're doing now on um, uh, with this restructuring or re, I don't know what to call it. What do you call it? Refactoring. <laughs> we're refactoring the show. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're getting a little more professional about it. <laughs> yeah. Listen, listen, hear me out. <laughs> 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 and what I'm one of the myself out. <laughs> one of the things that we're doing is we're coming up with a pre-flight checklist for the show, and uh, this was not something that was on there. And so, uh, apologies for that, but uh, we're gonna have to redo this episode. So, anyway, uh, Elio, what are you feeling like doing? You want to? redo the episode or do I, I you hate want to do to... that to people but for the recorded one now that we got it fixed like I mean, yeah, it's not you it's not useful for the um right like for the thing you know. and like i don't really want to finish out the conversation and then have this same conversation for you guys again you know yeah. um so let, let's let's just talk a little bit about since we have some of you here and uh you know the topic well, we're gonna have to come back to I yeah. Like what are the questions before we leave and re restart this? Like, what are the things you want to know specifically? Um, throw them in the chat. We'll hang out here for a few minutes and we'll try to make sure we address those and spend some time on the stuff you guys want to know. Um, yeah. Yeah. We were leading yeah. up to something with the energy stuff. We will cover that. We will cover. Yeah. I, I had an interesting conversation with someone about, oh, but solar energy is plentiful. And it's like, oh, it's not how it works, dude. It's not how it works. How do you sleep at night knowing you're so bad at podcasting? Yeah. Well, you see. <laughs> how do you think we're so bad at podcasting? We just sleep instead of doing work on yeah, this now. <laughs> exactly. Uh, how likely um, is a World effort. War Three event and would it help Earth in the long run? Boy, Alia is the right Ooh. person to ask that question, uh, <laughs> especially this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been a fun week. Um, oh, wow. There's so many places you could take that. Um, I'm okay, assuming let's... you're not asking, would World War Three help the Earth? Probably not so much. Um, uh, George Carlin but... would disagree. He'd say the world's <laughs> going to be fine. <laughs> You're talking about the humans on the earth. They're they're going to they're going to be screwed, but uh you know, the World War 3 um if I want I want to start off by saying how how likely is a World War 3 event? We don't know. Uh we really don't know. I would say that we're on a trajectory toward it. We're tr on a trajectory toward a resource war, and that's part of why there's an urgency in talking about Bitcoin mining because we are, in fact, taking away many of our finite resources for something that uh, doesn't provide us back any value other than to just, you know, exchange goods. And uh, when our water, uh, fresh water is running out, when our arable soil is running out, when our uh, you know, our air is becoming polluted when our oceans are becoming acidified. Um, we are, in fact, on a trajectory toward uh, a World War III event right now. However, that can change. You know, we can, in fact, yeah, see uh, we could pivot and we could change direction. So I can't make a prediction as to how likely it is. I can only say <laughs> that if things continue the way they're going right now, then pretty likely. However, I can also say that I don't know uh, what's going to happen in the future and at what point the powers that be are going to try and fix this problem in order to just maintain their own, um, you know, their own quality of life. So I think I'll, I'll leave that alone um, as, in terms of, you know, trying to predict it. Uh, and in terms of would it help the earth in the long run, anything that gets rid of us would help the earth in the long run, you know, so <laughs> just get rid of all the humans. But I, I would also say that that's, that's not really something that I would endorse. That's not something that I hope happens. I hope we make it off of the planet. I hope that 
Um, <laughs> I hope we have the opportunity to exploit many different planets, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like Durf's comment on, he says, our time on this planet is limited regardless, but we might as well make it as comfortable and last as long as possible. I totally right. agree with that. Yeah, To me, that's the ultimate question. We got 8 billion people almost, not quite there yet, but getting there. And how do we allocate the finite resources we have to give everyone a half decent life? To me, that's, that's, the, that's it. That's, it's that simple. There are actually a lot of good answers. Um, and it, it's, we get caught up in a lot of bullshit that get, leads us away from those solutions. And as far as the World War III thing, um, yeah, th like this is actually a question for my co-founder at EGX. Um, she has, th there's one guy that's getting all the press right now that she's like, uh, his stuff is oversimplified. It's not really great analysis. But if you actually get deep into studying sociology, um, yeah, we can actually predict reasonably well. <clears throat> there are certain things when a revolution will work. There are certain <clears throat> indicators, excuse me, of when a war is imminent and like studying people as systems has been done. There's an entire field of it. It's been ignored for the quote hard sciences, but yeah, no, you can actually, if you pay attention to this stuff, people have and do predict, um, there's a lot of think tanks and other groups that are like those countries. I actually, I know a guy locally who has a business that um, tries to predict when conflict's going to break out and they try to intervene and provide solutions. So um, it's not impossible at all. Uh, you just have to get into that. There's there's certain things you have to look for and certain indicators, and a lot of them are actually not obvious. So okay. it takes a fair amount of study. But yeah, you can totally predict when stuff's going to happen to within probably a decade or better. So. President Obama asks, is the relationship between USA and China a zero sum game? I mean, you you were the president, you know, better than me, yeah. but, um, I would say that, um, things can change over time. Uh, and they've, they, we, our relationship with China has changed multiple times already. Uh, it could become much more friendly in the future with less, um, you know, with more cooperation, um, Right now, I, I would say anytime you have two mega powers vying for control on our planet, it's inevitably a zero sum game if that's how it keeps going, uh, because, you know, you're just going to end up with with uh, a worse version of whatever we got now. But I, I, I don't think that it's predictable how politics change a lot. The world stage, new actors come onto it, some actors leave, you know, um, different kinds of economic changes happen. Um, you know, we don't know, we don't know what the impact of asteroid mining is going to be on, you know, the, the, on, on resources and, and, and on, uh, on wealth in the world and power. We don't know what, we, we don't know what wars are going to come along and, greatly change the the power dynamic of the world so uh again i think it's one of those things where we have to we as people who don't actually have our influence direct influence upon the 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 things that would impact that question um we have to sort of sit back and just express as best as we can through through podcasts through art through um, music through all, all the different things we can do uh, express what kind of world we want to live in and to try and create a critical mass of folks that agree with us um, you know without stepping without telling them they have to agree with us uh, I, I guess that's the best I got. Alio, you want to take that one? <laughs> um, I think it it is what what we want it to be, right? It, it depends on what mindset both nations are in. Uh, and this is actually one of my things. I think I've mentioned this with James. My most hated thing about cryptocurrencies is that they cement us. Like the, cryptocurrencies really are almost more of a religion. Like a lot of people that believe them believe them because they have libertarian or other principles. And they have these strong ideas and opinions about sovereignty. Um, the problem is those don't actually necessarily hold up when you deploy cryptocurrencies at scale and they kind of re-centralize and a lot of the 
supposed best parts don't work out. But the idea of a cryptocurrency, the idea of trading real resources for you know the ability to have money in a digital space, I think is a terrible idea. Um, that keeps you in a scarcity based mindset or zero sum mindset. And um, yeah, like uh, people seem to, they're so bought into what we have now that they're in, they can't even imagine something that would look different or better. And while we're stuck in that mindset where you, you, you know, we talk to people, you're, you try to put something in perspective about like what this is and you're like, Oh, that's this many terawatt hours. And they're like, huh? That sounds big, but it doesn't mean anything. And you're like, Oh, that's like $5 billion, which still is not, they don't really get like 5 billion is enormous. People don't really get like, think about counting to 5 billion. That'll take you months uh, at least. So that's like, yeah, what is 5 billion seconds? Can you hop on Wolfram Alpha and figure that out? 5 billion seconds to like a more comprehensive or a more, uh, I'm trying to remember how long it is. There was a great thing about a thousand seconds versus a million seconds versus a oh. billion seconds. <laughs> that is a lot of seconds. Wow. That is 158 years. Oh, there you go. So it would take more than a lifetime to count to 5 billion. So if you had $5 billion and you had to hand count it dollar per second, <laughs> <laughs> You're going to die before you finish. I don't know why so, I expected that to be a lot less time. <laughs> right. So, so we talk, we throw these huge numbers around and now we're throwing around billions and trillions. They're incomprehensible. And these aren't even big numbers. Like we were talking about owning and trading these uselessly large numbers. We're talking trillions and trillions and trillions of times larger than 5 billion. Um, so truly incomprehensible numbers. Um, yeah, like keeping us stuck in this zero sum mindset of having to trade like we are stuck on a planet with finite resources, but technology allows us to use to do more stuff with less resources. And so that's our cheat code is smart application of technology to utilize resources more effectively. The more we do of that, the more utopian a life we can achieve. I mean, there's other things that screw that up, but you know, that's as far as the resource part, which is critical for having a half decent life. If you can't get enough food and you can't get shelter and stuff, right. You're not going to have a great life. Yeah. Um, so you got to have at least that like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You got to get the basics down first and you can build on top of that. Um, but that's why I hate cryptocurrency is that's the worst thing about it. There's a lot of bad things about it, but keeping people stuck in that mindset of thinking of everything as a dollar amount and divorcing the actual like real world resources, the stuff that is like laws of nature, like <laughs> there's this much water. And if you don't get this much water per person, you're going to die, right? Like that's what's important. And how many Bitcoin or how many dollars you have doesn't map to that in a meaningful way. I mean, you could say, oh, well, if I'm rich, then I can I can like, you know, mess with the system and I can screw people over and I can, you know, buy stuff to, to take more than my share. OK, yeah, like, right. So it's not totally it maps if if you you know, if you're taking out a, if you're not looking at it from a fair standpoint, you're like, how can I corrupt the system to gain personal advantage? Totally. Um, <laughs> but. There's ways around that too. Like when we have a societal collapse because people start pulling that kind of shenanigans too much, then you have people showing up with weapons and things and being like, yeah, your dollars don't mean anything anymore. You don't get to take the water anymore. So anyway, yeah, I, I'm, I'm for things that let us really think about the resource usage and so, really think about how do we meet everyone's needs. I think we could easily double the world population past like we'd go to 16 billion people if we wanted. And we could have great lives. If you look at the work of Paolo Soleri and a whole bunch of other visionaries, there are ways to live very, very lightly and very well at a, a much higher standard of living than most people are accustomed to now using a fraction of the resources. You don't have to give anything up. Better life, less resources. But we keep making these trades of like we're willing to spend a ton of resources to get a mediocre life because that's what we have now. And that's there are certain people very comfortable with how things are set up because they get way more than their fair share. Why would they want it to change? And they're the ones that get to decide in a big way how to make it change. Right. And so, so they and don't. This, this is where Durf Diggler, um, you can ask Alio. Alio, how many years have I said to fix the planet we need to mod out greed from every human first? And that... <laughs> I've been saying this I, for years. I don't think you can do that. You have to find ways to control well, it. Right, right, right. But, the, you, but yeah. it, I still say it is a prerequisite to us actually being able to avoid uh, the tragedy of human scalability. 
And if you can't do it, then that means that the tragedy of human scalability is an inevitability. Yeah, I think what we need to do is we don't have to totally eliminate greed. You need a tiny bit of it, as you know, President Obama in the chat's pointing out. Um, but the problem is the Bernaysian principles. And we should do a whole show. I got to refresh my research. It's been a while. But Ed Bernays, um, he was like the father of modern advertising. Him and his contemporaries did a lot of work on manufacturing consent. And if you look at religions, there are certain things that most religions, certain emotions like greed, you know, don't covet your neighbor's wife, you know, don't murder. There's all these religions, these, you know, emotional things and urges that most religions seek to give you ways of controlling those. And if you look at, well, why? Why is this pretty common across most religions? Well, because for a society to function, if everyone's coveting everyone's stuff and just attacking people for their stuff, the society doesn't function very well. It collapses. So getting think people of all to control. Think that? of all your neighbor's wives too, you know, you just, <laughs> that'd be a creepy world right. to be in. <laughs> so, so you, you really, religion for a very long time for millennia has sought to control these urges that are, I'd say, anti-cohesive that rip a society apart to make sure societies can, can continue and be successful for generation after generation. But what Ed Bernays found, his innovation was, and I use that in the dark sense, um, was that capitalism, if you want to boost your sales and you want to really get capitalism going at full speed, if you can amp those up, if you can make people covet and be greedy and, oh, look at these new shoes. They're not really any different than the ones you have. They're not really better, but look, they're a new color. You need these new shoes now, you know, or take any random piece of crap product that you don't actually need. And so if you get people in this mindset of just needing and wanting, like, man, does it drive that economy, right? Everyone's constantly buying new crap, throwing away the old stuff. And so now there's a ton of opportunity to start businesses making new garbage that people don't fucking need. And, and that is fine to an extent. But when you start taking it to its logical conclusion, which is where I think we are now, um, it starts kind of ripping society apart you started amping up these anti-cohesive things that you can only take so much of that within a society. People can only be so selfish before you just have anarchy rather than a society. And so instead of celebrating and pushing the Bernaysian stuff as far as we possibly can, we need to be like, okay, okay, we took this a little too far. Like it's good to want some nice stuff, but it's also good to, you know, to be practical about this be like, you know what? I got shoes. They're fine. Right. Like my feet, they keep my feet warm. They keep my feet safe. They're really comfortable. I got shoes. I don't need more shoes, right? Maybe you do need a new, you know, water purifier, a new stove, a new TV, a new car. Maybe you do need that, but it's like, no, you don't need like five or 10 cars. That's, that's stupid. So, I, so, and it's fine if some people want to collect, but if everyone's like, oh, you need to have the newest car, like you're, you're throwing away real resources for not a lot of utility to society. This is, this, it's interesting that you brought up spirituality as a solution because it is, in fact, uh, what I have seen as the only non-genetic engineering-based uh, solution that uh, has actual measurable results. You know, you when you talk about, and when I say spiritual, I'm really just talking about a lifestyle. It's a, they, a lot of folks call it spiritual, but it's really just an unselfish lifestyle. And it's a, a lifestyle that says that you're going to be very conscientious and you're going to live your life in terms of doing things in order to help other people, in order, in order to help your community, in order to help you, you know, your, your own family, to help, to help other people. And one of the tenets of a spiritual lifestyle is to not ask for things except as it would help you to help other people more. And so in your case, you know, if I need some shoes, you know, it's okay to, to, to go and get some shoes. If you, if you need, now you need some, some hiking shoes. So this way you can actually, you know, go out and do hikes and maybe there, you have a good reason to do the, maybe you can help people by doing that. Uh, then yeah, get some hiking shoes. Uh, do you need some ten thousand uh, dollar, you know, gold leafed Nikes? Um, you know, maybe you could find a way where it's like, you know, actually, if I wear these 
and I go and I do these performances, I inspire people to actually live their best life. You could actually, you know, make an argument that you're helping out other people. But the idea would be that you're conscientious about and, and you, you live a lifestyle which allows you to be conscientious about your decision making in that and to know the difference between greed and, and enabling yourself to be able to help other people more. And I, I've been finding this just to be a fascinating subject because my whole life I was a person who just did not, I, I had no interest in spirituality for most of my entire life. And when I, and again, when I'm talking about spirituality, I'm talking about uh, that, that, that whatever that quality was in people who were religious and people who were, you know, they, they meditated a lot, people who, who did that. I just noticed that they were kind of happy <laughs> and I noticed that they were less greedy than a lot of the other people. Sure. Certainly there are examples of people like, uh, What's that guy's name? Uh, oh man, the, the 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 well, a lot of the televangelists, for example, uh, they they certainly do seem greedy. You know, I can't. I guess I don't really want to bring them into it because I don't know them. But uh, for the most part, the average person I know of that engages in a spiritual lifestyle, you know, they really do think through each of their decisions throughout the day in how well they can maximize their ability to help others. And that didn't require CRISPR. And so maybe there is some hope there, but on the other hand, it does seem like uh, spiritual spirituality and, and whatever you want to call it, let's just call it like a, an unselfish lifestyle. It seems like the unselfish lifestyle is becoming more and more and more rare. <laughs> you know, there are a lot That's, of ways yeah. to enable people to which, do the opposite. Which, when we look at a biological standpoint, like from a biological standpoint, um, the problem is it's the, the key, like the advantage we have over most other species, well, not most other, there are others that have this, but the big advantage of being human is collaboration and cooperation, right? There's only so much that one person can do. And you look at huge things, skyscrapers and ocean liners and pyramids and all these other monuments, like there's no way you do that with a handful of people. Like you've got to get a whole bunch of people together and like going to the moon and potentially Mars and all this, right? It takes tons of people collaborating to solve big problems. That is our cheat code. That is how we make a ton of progress is by collaborating. And it makes it really hard to collaborate when everyone's selfish and greedy. So being selfish and greedy actually undermines our ability for progress. So, and that's what I've never understood is if you are wealthy and you have a lot of resources, you're a multi-billionaire or whatever. Um, I don't understand, like, I guess I get if you're just comfortable and you just don't care and you're like, my life's great and I don't give a damn about anyone else, then I guess you'd want things to stay the same. But personally, I've always been really curious about like, what's the next thing? Like jetpacks and flying cars and all the sci-fi crap that was on TV as a kid, some of which we kind of are starting to have now. Um, like, yeah, dude, let's, let's have those. Let's make that work. Like, let's see how much farther we can push it. Can we make a train that travels faster than the speed of sound in an evacuated tube, not hyperloop freaking remember the uh, last, uh, what was it? Uh, evacuated tube transport before hyperloop took all the glory was the better version. Yeah. And hyperloop is like the half-assed version yeah. in true Musk style. But, um, <laughs> anyway, like I want all that crazy stuff. Like I want to be able to hop on a train, get some legit Chinese food like in two hours from anywhere in the U S be like, boom, best city in China, grab some great food, hop back over here, not even have to waste a day. Right. You waste four hours on this train that's going supersonic. So if you want the really cool stuff, if you want those, like I've always loved sci-fi novels where we talk about like having utopia. Um, and yeah, the way you get there is by being really smart with your resources and getting just really going nuts on the science. And we had that, we had that partly because of the cold war, we went nuts. We just threw military research money at scientists for like invent all the things, invent the internet and just bring everything else you can. 
And the quality of our lives is vastly improved by that. And the problem is we've now given it over to private venture capital and private equity and private equity is dumb. Like military dollars are like make crazy things happen. And like, and I can tell you this, I, I can't share too many details, but I'm working on a government grant right now. There's no way a company would pay for what we're doing. There's no freaking way. It's literally impossible sounding stuff that might not even work. But the military, the government, in this case, the science foundation is like, here, try it. See what happens. See if you can make this work. Because if, if you pull it off, a whole bunch of people's lives are going to be way better for having pulled this off. And if you don't, it was at least worth trying that and making sure, like, can we do this? Because the benefits are really, really profound. And that's the problem is the private equity. A friend of mine who owns a software, um, he's high up at a software company locally, kind of medium sized software company. Um, we were talking to last week and he's like, you know, it's awesome. He's like, when private equity snaps up one of our competitors, he's like, they're not our competitor anymore. He's like, we actually turn a profit and have legit customers. Like we work for them and we work to just have a sustainable business that makes a steady profit. He's like, as soon as private equity snaps up our competitors, they fire anyone competent because they want to, you know, cut staffing costs and they pull in a whole bunch of morons. Don't know what they're doing because they're underpaying them. So they can't get anyone good. And they just restructure everything. They strip mine the company. He's like a year or two later, the company's gone, right? It's not there anymore. So he's like, as soon as I see an investment in one of our competitors, he's like, all right, we had five competitors. Now we have four. <laughs> so Durf said the key to utopia is everyone having access to the Star Trek replicator. No more want, no more war. <laughs> and uh, I have to disagree as a hardcore Trekkie. Um, the Star Trek replicator was not free. Uh, in fact, it cost a certain amount of, um, uh, it, at least this is okay. So this isn't Canon by the way, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, there was a lot of questioning as to why it was that quark could uh, charge people for replicated drinks on deep space nine. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the generally accepted fan theory is that, uh, it still costs money to replicate things both uh, either in terms of the um, either in terms of the energy usage. So the a starship, for example, if we're talking about the NCC 1701D from mm -hmm. from Star Trek Next Generation, there's a finite amount of energy uh, even from the dilithium crystals in the reactor that uh, would ne regularly you see necessitates that they have to divert power from one system to another system and things like that. And so, and presumably it takes a lot of energy to be able to replicate something, uh, you know, converting something from just energy into matter is, a, it, it would require a huge amount of energy to be able to pull something like that off. And so the idea was that the um that uh one of two things one is that it costs you energy out of your star you know uh because keep in mind they're in a post-currency world right but there was something that they had a certain ration for how much they could actually use the replicator for and so somebody could save up their rations in order to um, replicate something really fancy. And you see that actually said in a, in a few of the episodes. So they, they're like, I saved up my, my, my replicator rations in order to do this. And then another thing is, uh, licensing fees for exotic, um, patterns that would be coming from, uh, uh, civilizations that still do have a monetary system. And mm -hmm. so for example, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, what was the, uh, what was the, um, currency in deep space nine that, uh, everybody wanted to get their hands on. It was the, this metal you had slips and you had, um, I can't remember bars of, um, it's like plat. Oh. Anyway, uh, the point oh, is, it was is gold press, uh, gold. Yeah. It? Gold. It was, it was gold press. Latinum or something Latinum, like that. Latinum, that's it, Latinum that's it. Or, no, yeah, right? you're right. It, it's, I think it's Latinum. Uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, it's, been, it's been a while. I haven't really watched Star Trek. It is. It's gold while. press Latinum. That's it. Uh, you got it. So, um, <laughs> still in there, though. 
got to so dig you, a little, but it's still in there. Right. So you still had to actually give that to uh, a Ferengi in order to get them to to do anything because they're just not they're an entirely transactional based you know culture. And so um, anyway, the point is, is that even when you have a replicator, the replicator is limited by the number of patterns that are on it. If you want to get a good pattern, you're going to have to give somebody something that they want in exchange for their good pattern, because presumably it takes a long time to program in a really great pattern. They over and over show this on Deep Space Nine because Quark would have shipped in these different kinds of drinks and different kinds of food because apparently it tastes better than the stuff that hmm. you would get out of the replicator. And well, they, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as just, just so the story's not, you know, completely like broken. I remember like the replicator stuff is not, yeah. You know, if, if you could just have anything and there's no, you know, it's like we talked about printing your own money, it would be hard to write a compelling story. Right. You're just like, I want this, make it. Right. It's <laughs> there's got to be struggle for a story to be compelling. So I remember it was like it was a close enough imitation of the real thing, but it wasn't exactly the real thing, because otherwise, like there's a whole bunch of plot devices that just fall apart if you can just make whatever you need and just conjure it out of right out of yeah. thin air, as it were. So, yeah, so totally. It was also uh, another interesting thing was um, like uh, Neelix on uh, Voyager he actually ran an entire kitchen, right? And he tried to get fresh foods and, and cook. And one of the things that they said on there was that uh, there's actually an aspect of morale that goes along with uh, creating a mess and having folks, you know, clean it up together and stuff like that. And so um, presumably, uh, you know, the there's value in actually procuring real things as well. But anyway, I guess that didn't have anything to do with, well, um, it, you know, um, replicator. yeah, no, I mean that that's true. Like, so that's something we've seen in the U S military. Um, if you look at the history of rations in the U S army, um, there, there's actually a cool website. I found that the, they kind of have links to, you can buy MREs civilian versions. They have a whole history of all the MREs and, initially the K rations were like spam and just, you know, not good. And so like, you're out there, you're risking your life. You're trying not to get killed. And now you're eating this crap food too. And your morale, just everything sucks, right? You may not make it past tomorrow. Your me last meal might've been this piece of, you know, this awful tasteless crap in a can. Um, so they switched to MREs and those have gotten incredible. Like the, even when I was in many, many years ago, it was about 20 years ago at this point. Um, they're pretty good and they've keep making them better and better and getting rid of like the nasty hot dogs. They finally ditched those. Uh, those were disgusting. Ever. I never had to eat those, but I would watch other people. I'm like, God, those look gross. They're like, you want to trade? I'm like, Nope, absolutely not. You want to fight? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not eating that crap. Yeah. Um, so one thing they did though, is they started putting in actual like candy, like you'd find just at any store in the U S because when you're in combat and everything is foreign and everything sucks, just even op getting a pet, like actually oh, there you whoop, are. dip there. Yeah. You're getting back. a bag of Skittles though, or a Snickers or something that you've, you know, you enjoyed at home and you associate with, you know, good times, good memories, Halloween, et cetera. Um, and no, they don't screw you. It's not fun size. You get full size stuff in there. Um, I never understood how fun size, like how is having like a single bite of candy bar more fun? That seems like not fun size. Um, but yeah. Anyway, like that has psychologically that does an, a ton for morale is like seeing stuff from home and just like right. literally throwing bags of Skittles in there. So I, I, I found a citation on here. So um, light, uh, Voyager went deep into the replicators and talking about the energy. Oh, OK. And uh, they actually um, they in the episode Dark Frontier, they said that. Uh, one of the characters says, we have to keep moving. If we take the replicators offline and run environmental systems at half power, we can go another 20 light years before refueling. And so that's a huge amount of energy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that's, yeah. that's pretty crazy when you think about how much energy that the replicators actually use. And then uh, Janeway was shown saying on multiple occasions 
that it would deplete the energy reserves if they don't ration it down. And Chakotay actually, um, the thing I was thinking of was that he saved his replicator rations so he could make a watch for Janeway for a present. Mm, okay. And so um, apparently, yeah, it still costs something. And um, even though, for example, uh, the Starfleet does not have a currency system, they don't have a monetary system, uh, on Deep Space Nine, they were in orbit around Bajor, and they were coming in contact with Ferengi and with Klingons and and all these other you know civilizations that do have currency systems. And if they wanted anything that they had, they would have to procure some sort of um, actual you know uh, currency from one of them to give it to the other. And they didn't get a rash. They they didn't get it like an allowance from Starfleet, and uh, so yeah, when they went to Quark's bar, you they still had to have some kind of uh, trade for being able to either use the holodecks or to be able. I don't know if they were called holodecks, were they, in uh, Quark's bar? Uh, that I don't know. Hollow Suite, I think they called it. Hollow. Yeah, Suite. that sounds right. Uh, Quark's bar. Let's see. Yeah, the hollow suite. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, and then on top of that all, you know, um, people would still fight over, you know, significant others. People would still fight over a coveted ship. You know, people still would fight over the ability to settle in a certain place. There's always going to be some kind of finite resource that people are going to you know, cause start wars over. And you can see that back in like our own history. <laughs> I love that we're talking about this. Like it's real, it's real history. And it's like back in human history, um, <laughs> you know, you have uh, entire wars were waged because of somebody who wanted a particular princess and somebody who wanted a particular, you know, uh, a, a particular plot of land, you know? So I, I don't think that the replicator is going to solve all of our problems, but it may solve some of them. Uh, it, it would be a very useful, very useful tool. Uh, just, I guess, until we get into some of the, if unless we get a canon description of how much actual energy it really takes and uh, why, you know, why folks can't just replicate out, you know, gold plated latinum, uh, then, you know, or gold pressed latinum, then that's that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, and, and that's the one thing to, I mean, we should restart the stream. I don't know if we'll do that right now or whenever, but uh, anyway, um, that's the thing that's crazy about blockchain is it's kind of the anti replicator is instead of taking resources like lots of energy like you pointed out and turning it into something that you might want real goods it takes lots of resources and turning turns it into a placeholder for real goods that may or may not be <laughs> redeemable you at know, a later date it would be cool if we could actually do a star trek themed episode uh, episode here that was all about talking as though you know blockchain is like using the replicator on voyager to print out ridiculously long, you know, like volumes of books that just simply had numbers inside of them, you know, like that is essentially what it is. Yeah, and, yeah, basically. And then it Ish. becomes like a thing where, you know, somebody on, we could write an episode where somebody's using up the, the replicator rations in order to print out these books with numbers in them. And then those become the thing that people start trading for other kinds of resources on the, on the ship until there are no resources left and everybody's just left with books. <laughs> I think that'd be a good uh, discovery episode or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh man that actually that's a cool angle i kind of want to write out an article or something on um like um you know how how bitcoin is like a dysfunctional starfleet ship you know so <laughs> anyway uh we're out of time for tonight so uh anything you want to go over before we go um yeah, no, I think we covered it. It was a fun little tangent. Um, I don't know if we'll redo that, uh, the episode, but uh, 
Yay, technology. Yeah. Anyone who thinks that <laughs> I, there's so many, oh my God, all these trendy technologies like IoT and blockchain and machine learning, uh, well, especially when it's branded as AI, like all of these things, all of them again and again, remind me of you're, you're stuck in a hole and your solution to get yourself out of the hole is to dig as fast as you can. <laughs> and it's like, stop, stop digging. That's, that's not how you get out of the hole. You get out of the hole by finding a way up, not continuing to dig deeper down. Like, yeah. well, anyway. All right. Well, we're going to have to redo the episode. Um, and we will, but, uh, I do want to thank you guys for helping us out with that. I did do a test recording before the show. But as you listen to in the recording, it was something where one of them was just slightly off timing from the other one. And it got worse and worse and worse as the episode went on. And so I wasn't going to catch that in a pre-flight, yeah. you know, uh, in our current pre-flight checklist. So I'm going to now add the uh, step in here, a check for whether or not this particular button is clicked in our audio mixer yeah. it's like uh <laughs> so i'll have to double check that i just but... want to be able to program things anyway <laughs> it's amazing that we have to i have to run through checklists over here because some of the software i'm using for like the lighting especially doesn't remember its settings like my lights yeah. have to be reset up every time and the software to control them the lights have to be re-added to the software every time yeah. So, um, yeah, it's I'm awesome. looking forward to the day when you say you remember when I complained about those lights all the time. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's probably going to go down as you remember back when we only had like one checklist and it only took like 10 minutes to set up the show. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh... Now it takes two hours to get all the tech, you know. <laughs> We have to do an animal sacrifice and then all this kind of stuff. And then sometimes it works. Sometimes DC spent 25 hours researching a vegan alternative to the animal sacrifice. <laughs> um, okay. So anyway, uh, on behalf of everybody at fault tolerant live productions, thank you for watching or listening. The show is only possible due to the generous contributions of our subscribers and our sponsor EGX.org, a nonprofit that cultivates the Arizona tech community. Code and chaos is recorded live with audience interaction and we're still coming up with a new schedule so we'll we'll figure that out and then if you enjoyed the show please do consider subscribing or rating the show on twitch youtube or your favorite podcasting app and until next time take care keep washing your hands and don't break your tech if it doesn't work right good night folks